Okay, today we're going to be talking about the goddess Leto, one of the female Titan goddesses uh, who was <laughs> got together with uh, Zeus. Uh, he got together with quite a few individuals. Uh, mother of the twin gods, Apollo uh, and Artemis, uh, obviously a very strong friend of the Trojans and very much beloved and respected later on uh, in Greek mythology. Uh, she is oftentimes understood as a goddess of motherhood uh, with her children. Uh, as a result, she is known as a protectress of the young. We'll, we'll go ahead and go into some details, but I want to begin with a lovely Orphic hymn, 35, dedicated to Leto, just to kind of draw us in a little bit. So it begins as follows. To Leto. Fumigation from myrrh. Here he goes. Dark veiled Leto, much invoked queen, twin bearing goddess of noble mien. Coantus, great, a mighty mind in thine, offspring prolific, blessed of Zeus divine. Phoebus proceeds from thee, the god of light, and Artemis fair, whom winged darts delight. She in Ortigia's honored regions born, in Delos he which lofty mounts adorn. Hear me, O queen, and favorably attend, and to this consecration divine afford a pleasing end. There's my introduction to the goddess Late Leto. Now, much of the early scholarship connected to Leto um, relates to her what her name means. Now, the Greeks have their interpretation, and we'll go there right away. Some will say that her name comes from uh, Lethe, which means oblivion. Other Greeks in ancient times will say it comes from Lotos, which means lotus which is the fruit that brings oblivion uh, to those who eat it, according to their beliefs. Uh, it could also mean hidden one. But um, Plato, uh, in his Critolus, constructs uh, philosophical etymologies uh, for the names of the gods and states via the words of Socrates as follows. Uh, he will say, uh, let us inquire. What thought men had in giving them, the gods, their names. The first men who gave names to the gods were no ordinary persons, but high thinkers and great talkers. Leto is named from her gentleness, because whatever is asked of her, she is willing. Um, but perhaps her name is Letho, as she is called by many foreigners, and those who call her by that name seem to do so on account of her mild and gentle, Leon, kindness of her character. So Plato will have it as, as this idea of mild or kindness, right? Others will have it as oblivion or lotus. However, we now know that uh, so often the Greeks have their own interpretation of what these words mean, but it actually means something else. Uh, it is related uh, to a Lycian word, which is lada, which means woman or wife. Uh, in fact, uh, in many cases, they will say that the Lycian lada may be the origins for the Greek name leda. Uh, it is a consensus of many scholars that uh, this word was not originally a Greek word at all, uh, but that it stems uh, from ancient Anatolia and specifically the area of the Lycian region, which I think is interesting. In fact, a little bit further, scholars have now moved back the date of this word from the Lycians back to uh, those known as the Luca, or understanding this as a Luvian name. So this goes way the far back, which is fascinating. 
already we're getting somewhere. According to Pindar, uh, she was known as Lito Preseliketos, which of course means Lito of the Golden Shaft, uh, connected to the golden bows and arrows, which by the way, way she has bows and arrows, that reminds me of somebody. It sure does. It reminds me of, of Artemis, which, of course, this epithet was readily applied to Artemis, her daughter, as well. So, uh, like uh, mother, like daughter, and so forth. In fact, as early as Homer, do we find Artemis called by this name? And so, uh, there we have it. So, going into the origins, in general, uh, Leto was one of the Titans, a bride of Zeus. As I said, the mother of the gods Apollo and Artemis, right? Goddess of motherhood. But um, she's also um, known as the goddess later on of modesty and of demure. And you could see that a little bit in Plato's interpretation of that word. Like her sister, Asteria, uh, she was also considered the goddess of the night or of the light of day, depending on the context. When Leto was pregnant with the twins, uh, as we know, she was pursued relentlessly by Hera, who drove her from uh, land to land, uh, preventing her from finding a place to rest and give birth. But as you know, the floating island of Delos eventually provided her with refuge. Later, when she was traveling to Delphi, the giant uh, Titios uh, attempted to abduct her. We'll go into all this part of the story a little bit later. But Apollo intervened and slew her with arrows. We're going to go into some alternative perspectives of the story. Just kind of giving you the lay of the land, so to speak. In Greek vase painting, Leto was usually depicted as a woman lifting her veil in a gesture of modesty. But that was not always the case. Uh, and she's oftentimes depicted with her two children uh, more later on than earlier. We'll go into that as well. Uh, Leto was known to favor two animals, uh, that being the rooster and the other, the mongoose of all things. Um, so concerning these, uh, uh, the, the writer Alien, not to be confused with somebody who's extraterrestrial, on his work called On Animals, writes as follows. He says, I learn uh, that uh, the rooster is the favorite bird of Leto. The reason is, they say, that he was at her side when she so happily brought to bed of twins. That is why to this very day, a rooster is at hand when a woman R happens to be in travail and is believed somehow to promote an easy delivery. I don't know. Does anybody want to bring in a rooster into the uh, uh, the room when somebody's giving birth? I don't. Do you think that would help things out? Do you, what do you What do you think? No, no. Okay. All right. So <laughs> I, just, I just don't find roosters terribly, uh, I don't comforting. Uh, especially at such a such a time. Uh, anyway, uh, the mongoose. Um, he notes as follows that the mongoose is both male and female in the same individual, partaking of both sexes and nature has enabled each single same animal both to procreate and to give birth. The mongoose are said to be sacred to Lido uh, and Elethia and the people of Heracopolis worship them, so they say. Now, I find this interesting. Uh, I did a little research on this, and there's not a lot on it, but it does connect to an interesting topic that we'll go into later on, is that Leto uh, somehow uh, kind of moves between the boundary of female and male, male and female, and they believe that the mongoose reflected this idea obviously this is not you know this is not very scientific you know this is this is a realm of belief right <laughs> i'm reporting the news okay so so <laughs> the one question is where they got this idea from but uh that would be an interesting study in and of itself but i didn't want to follow that uh 
<laughs> that that uh, that option. Somebody says that she's she's a time lord. Okay, well maybe maybe that's what it is, right? Okay, all right. So most sources agree that Lita was born of of of, um, of Chaos and uh, and Phoebe, uh, including Pindar. Uh, so we have uh, so you basically have uh, these two. Uh, let's talk about Phoebe. I do have an image of Phoebe, so why don't we go to the image of Phoebe uh, real quick? So there we go. So so we got, we got Phoebe there uh, on on the on the right. You can see her, right? Uh, on the far left, uh, that is actually Leto, right there. Uh, so you can see that and. Uh, in, in the middle uh, is, of course, Asteria, their, their sister. So you have the three uh, there on top, which I, I find it interesting. This image of Phoebe is from a fresco at Herculaneum. And uh, what, what Phoebe's trying to do is pacify Leto and Niobe uh, there, too. Uh, so it's, it's fascinating. So there you go. I'll just say a little bit about Phoebe right here. Uh, she was a Titan goddess. A bright intellect and was the third goddess to hold the oracle of Delphi. Her name is derived from the Greek word phoibos, meaning bright, uh, and phobio, meaning to purify. The name of Leto's mother, uh, Phoebe, is identical to the epithet of her son, Apollo, phoibos, right? Uh, throughout Homer, of course, mentioned in that way. Uh, she is known as a Titan goddess of prophetic radiance, often associated with Selene, or the goddess of the moon. She, however, had never been referred to as the goddess of the moon, just connected to the prophetic aspect as well as the radiance. So I find that interesting. Of course, uh, uh, there is a special connection to her, to the intellect, too. As I mentioned, uh, a secularist will mention that. Of course, today she's one of the, the moons of Saturn, right? <laughs> and then, of course, uh, let's go on to uh, Koyos. Let's go to the next one. Next image. Oh, wait, wait. I like this image here. Uh, sorry, that was Niobe in the middle. A correction there. So you got Phoebe on the right, Niobe in the middle. Uh, you can see uh, Leto on the left of there. Uh, this just makes it more clear so you can see it better. Let's go to the next image. That's great. Koyos, yes. He was one of the elder titans, uh, the son of Uranus. Uh, obviously, we, today we say uh, Uranus. Uh, I don't say it that way because, um, uh, well, well, I mean, it's like a, in, in Greek, it'd be like almost like a U with an umlaut over it, which is an U sound, which is the word for heaven in ancient Greek. So anyway, uh, one of the, the sons of Uranus, as well as Gaia, which is the Earth. And, uh, he and his brothers uh, were the ones who conspired against uh, dear old dad. Uh, they laid an ambush on him as he descended down to be with mom, uh, Mama Earth. Uh, in fact, these uh, four siblings uh, happened to be watching at, from their posts uh, at the corners of the world. And they suddenly rushed from those corners, those four corners, and they seized hold of him and held him fast while Kronos uh, did the job of, well, castrating him with the sickle. Uh, uh, in, in this particular myth, the brothers uh, personified the great pillars, which we often see in various uh, Near Eastern cosmologies, and they are holding the earth and heaven apart. Or sometimes they're the ones who are holding the whole cosmos a lot. Koyos, by the way, his alternative name uh, is Polos, which means the North Pole, which obviously says that uh, of the four corners, uh, he is in charge of the pillar of the North. Uh, his brothers, Hyperion, Iaptus, and Cryos, on the other hand, over the West, East, and South. Koyos, as god of the axis of heaven around which the constellations all revolve, right, because he's in the north, was probably also the god dedicated to oracles, heavenly oracles, just as his wife, Phoebe, 
presided over the oracles of the axes of the earth at Delphi, uh, a role, of course, later on inherited uh, by their grandson, Apollo. Uh, so basically, the Titans were, as you know, uh, <laughs> overthrown by Zeus and his cast of characters, thrown into Tartarus. Hesiod uh, mentions this, that this is a void located beneath the foundations of everything uh, where the earth, sea, and sky have the roots. Here, the Titans shift in cosmological terms from being the holders of heaven to the bearers of the entire cosmos. So uh, there you have that. So, yeah, that was great. Uh, let's go to the next image, but I think we're done with images. Let's see, I think. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll take that one down. We'll, we'll, we'll refer to that in a few seconds. Okay. So without question, the earliest stratum of worship of Leto arise from Western Anatolia, which is, of course, Asia Minor, known as Turkey today, especially along the Western and Southern coastlines, roughly from Ephesus to Caria, through Lycia, Pamphylia, and Cilicia, and of course uh, into the Aegean, uh, especially uh, Crete, Delos, and Kos. In most of these cities, Lido appears uh, to have a background of being understood as a great mother, having a direct relationship with other mother goddesses in these regions. In fact, she is oftentimes understood to be an aspect of them. Now, of course, there's a contest between Ephesus and Lycia and Delos over where she gave birth to Artemis and Apollo, as well as others, indicative how she is believed to equally be a part of their mythologies, revealing that she may have equally been worshipped amongst them when these areas happen to be more unified, more unified, right? Of course, we now know that the Minoan realm equally includes the Aegean and the western and southern coasts of Anatolia, especially at a place called Miletus. We have found Minoan uh, ceramics there. We know that they had a settlement there. We have other evidence, too, of other cities, even at Ephesus. I actually was at Ephesus at the time, in 2008, when they discovered the Minoan part uh, of, of the city just below Aesilic Hill. I was actually there at the time. I saw them digging. So, yeah, the Minoans were there. Saw the pottery for myself. Now, we also know that uh, so the Urza Minoans are along this coastline. And so there is this religious and cultural connection here, and maybe in a political sense. <clears throat> we also know that the Mycenaeans, when the Minoans were no longer there, filled that vacuum along the coast of, uh, of, of Ana, uh, Asia Minor, of, of Anatolia, and they, they held that all the way until the 12 into the uh, first part of the 1100s BCE. I uh, did a whole talk on that. Mycenaeans were very active there. But there's the other side of the story, and that is not only was this an area where there's Mycenaeans, Minoans and the Mycenaeans there, but also a group known as the Luvians or Luvians. It was their territory because it happened to be uh, their territory all along, again, Western Anatolia, uh, and of course, the, the southern part of Anatolia. So it's kind of like the intermix of these two, actually three different cultures, all kind of put together. So uh, there you have it. Yeah, behind it all, Lido's origins are not completely uh, Indo-European. It seems to have a mixed legacy showing that she goes way far back way far back even though the luvians are indo-european it looks like there's even roots going a little bit further we'll investigate that too now while we may surmise that the earliest stories concerning leto were widespread throughout western anatolia and, and the aegeans many of these regions would lose these traditions with a few vestiges remaining uh, specifically uh, on crete and ephesus and most especially which we'll be looking at 
in a lot of detail in Lycia, uh, which became, because of its actually its relative isolation for a long time, it retained many of these ancient traditions. Because of this fact, our search for Leto must begin first and foremost uh, with the Lycians. So who are they? Right. Well, we know that the Lycians are one and the same as the Luca. Uh, in fact, let's go to the, the, the image that we just had up. Let's take a look at this. There it is. All right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we know that the Lycians called themselves the Termale, uh during the classical Greek era uh, throughout uh, through to the Roman Empire. And we find a reference to this fact in inscriptions as well as in Herodotus. At Xanthos, there stands this, you're, you're looking at right now, this, this trilingual stele with the designation uh, Termali, uh, making a direct equivalent uh, to the Greek uh, Lucia. You can see it right there. And uh, so we know for a fact, this is fascinating, that the, <laughs> we're, you're looking at it right here, <laughs> that the Lycians were the Luca. Got it? They were the Luca. And of course, the Luca, we know for a fact, absolutely 100%, not 99, not 9.5, 100%, they are Luvian. There's no doubt, no reputable scholar today will say otherwise. Got it? So we have a direct connection here, right? Okay, so they are the Luca. Now, of course, I, I will say a little aside to this, that the Luca can be looked at this particular region, uh, referring also to uh, later on, they'll become known as Lycians, but the Luca, of course, are the Luvians. But the word Luca sometimes is used in a general term not just for the south, but as well as the western part uh, of Anatolia or Asia Minor, uh, inclusive of the other Luvian areas. So in other words, it can be used in a broader sense, and it can be used in a smaller sense. But we know for a fact in the smaller sense, uh, here it is, right there. You just compare the Greek and the Lycian. Lycian is the Luca. Uh, it makes that connection. Cool? Good. I like having this here so you can see it. So we know that the Lycians or the Luca were part of the Asua League and that uh, the Mycenaeans, also known as the Achaeans, were very much involved in the affairs of the Asua League during the 14th into the 13th centuries BCE. And we know directly they were involved with the Luca as well. The Lycians were depicted as a key uh, defendants with the Trojans against the Mycenaeans. However, uh, this is, of course, by the late part of 13th into the early part of the 12th uh, centuries. Uh, the Lycians, not to go too much, I just mentioned a few other things. Uh, they're all already causing problems uh, as pirates, uh, especially around the Cyprus region, according to the Amarna records from the 14th century BCE. The Luca, in this sense, uh, were uh, from, again, the region of Lycia. Uh, and uh, and I, I want to mention that that some of them were used as mercenaries for Ramses II in the early part of the 13th century BCE. Later, they became part of a group known as the Sea Peoples. When the Hittites seized Cyprus, uh, since Cyprus is near their locality, they seized it back. Uh, so there you have, there you have that. Uh, so yeah, so we're looking into a uh, a Lycian goddess, right? Mother goddess, right? Okay. Um, let's go to the next uh, image, I believe. Mm. Uh, we will get to this image in a few seconds. We'll put it down temporarily, but we'll put that right up in a few seconds. Thank you. What were the what was the religion of the Luca? Well, that's or the Lycians or the Luvians, right? That's a whole nother topic. 
But uh, let's just make a shorthand version of this. We know from the Iliad uh, that they worshipped the god Apollo. Uh, so we know that. And so when Glaucos is in need, he will pray to him with uh, the special epithet. And then, of course, uh, when he is killed, uh, Apollo is the one to take his body back to, uh, to Lycia to receive a proper burial. This is according uh, to the Iliad. Another goddess that is connected to the Luvians is actually Demeter. Now we can bring that image right up again. Demeter, who was indeed the Luvian mother goddess, sometimes uh, known as Asasara, often uh, called, uh, also known as uh, Huawasarana, right? Uh, sometimes known as the Madonna of the Luvians. By the way, the designation Asasara is found in so many Minoan ritual objects as well. And it's also found on libation tables and sacrificial vessels. It's on a statue that's by no end, even a silver pin. Uh, in fact, a total of 16 different times. Now, three linear A tablets list this goddess who is Asasara, also known as Huwasana, as Damata. Damata. Well, what is what is what is that? Well, that is Demeter, and you're taking a look at at that right now, uh, in Linear B. Now, of course, uh, sorry, uh, Linear A in this case. Sorry, um, we have only uh, one thousand four hundred Minoan inscribed uh, clay tablets fragments so far, revealing seventy hieroglyphic signs forming about. 1,025 words. The good news is that 15 of these Minoan hieroglyphic signs and 45 of these words can be read because they have Luvian counterparts. But we know this word, of course, then goes into Mycenaean. Okay, so um, oh, we can put this down now. Thank you. The connections between the Luka goddess, Ani, Mahahani, and Da Mata is also uh, apparent uh, during the Bronze Age. Ani Mahahani was specifically called Anis Masanasis uh, in Luvian, which translates as Mother of the Gods. Right? So uh, also she is known as Ani Huahi Abiai which means she is the mother of the sanctuary. She is always referred to as one and the same as Leto in later inscriptions. Oh, I know you want documentation. Trevor Bryce, one, one of the foremost Luvian scholars, as well as Jan Zal uh, in the Lycians and Literary and Epigraphic Sources. And I'll even give you the page number 174 is that <laughs> sorry uh, anyway uh, and so we can directly connect the luvian any mahani with lido derived from the word lada which i said before is the listening word for woman or wife in this sense lido is both mother and possibly wife but whose wife Traditionally, Zeus, who is the most uh, most definitely not her husband, impregnated her. But according to this inscriptions, there's a drum roll playing, I think. The Baal deity that finds close associations to her, other than her children, Artemis and Apollo, is almost always Poseidon. Yes, we are going on our own Poseidon adventure here. So we know, uh, of course, Poseidon was the supreme god of the Minoans, right? Hmm. So let's go a little deeper. So now Poseidon, while he was understood as a god of the sea by the archaic era of Greece, 
We know from my Noah and my Sinan sources that he was actually worshipped as one powerful deity over three aspects. He was in charge of the sky. He was in charge of the earth, inclusive of the sea. And he was in charge of the underworld. As a underworld or chthonic god, he used the epithet <clears throat> that we know so well, which survived up to later on, uh, the word um, enosichthon, which of course means earth shaker, uh, which in, if you want to know, uh, is actually in linear B. And of course, I'll go ahead and give you the name in linear B. Uh, his name is Enesidione, speaking some uh, very ancient Greek. And of course, as we know, the word Poseidon means husband or lord <clears throat> from the, the Greek, uh, posis, right? Posis uh, from potis, uh, you know, and another element, of course, you know, that's that's lord or husband. And then the other part, <clears throat> so that's that's the post part. And the Iden part, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we know co comes from the word earth. You got da, da, uh, do, Doric for ge, and of course you also have Ida. So it's post Ida, which of course uh, means husband of the earth. And of course, who, who who's the uh, <clears throat> who's he with? Uh, he is with uh, Demeter, as we know. Da, de, ye, Ida, right, means means earth. Uh, mater means mother. So, post Iden, husband of the earth, with the mater, right, uh, earth mother. And the mater is also connected directly to any Mohani, which, of course, you see the connection there, which is the great goddess. Are you seeing these connections? And they, in turn, as we have already noted, are directly connected to, through inscriptions, and I even gave you even the detail to where to find if you want to look, to Lido. Guys got it? This is all coming down. And there's other sources, too. I just had to give you at least one to look up. Okay. What are we doing? They're doing pretty good. <laughs> but let's take a look. Uh, let's actually go to the image of Poseidon. Uh, this comes from Mycenaean period of time. Or it's, it's people say that this is this is Poseidon, the next one. Oh, I guess I didn't I didn't have it. Huh, okay. I guess it didn't show through. Or maybe it'll appear at some point. But let's see if this is the next one. Just like just like curious. Nope. Okay. Uh go back. That's fine. Okay, so um so here we go. I'll actually actually those, those are good. These are images. That's that's fine. Yeah, th these are images here of any Mahahani. Uh, so you can see that there. Uh, let's go to the next one. This is another image of her. So this was right. It's kind of small, though. I'm sorry. I wish it was better. Okay, let's go to the next image. I think this will, this will be Poseidon here. Oh, no, I guess not. All right. Uh, I just want to show this this right here. I'm going to be describing uh, some of the worship here of this goddess. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and do it right now since we see this image. This image is so small, it probably doesn't really help. But I want to tell you a little bit about this early um, goddess. So you can see it there. You can put it down there. So let's talk about this early goddess. Some of the worship there. So let's talk about uh, Huwa Sasasana. Uh, who is she? Well, we know that she had, uh, and of course, later on, she will be connected uh, to Leto. So this, which, but I'll give a chance to understand that Luby is a little bit more. Uh, she is, uh, her worship was centered at a place called Hupsena, which today is Eregli, which is southeast of Konya uh, and north uh, east of, of, sorry, northwest of, of Mersin. This was the ancient realm of the lower lands of the Luca or the Luvians. And here, as I said, was a center of various worship. I'm just trying to get some more water here. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> no, it is, no it, 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 you'll, you'll get it in a second. Uh, second, Because you know why? Because I'm talking about a drinking ceremony. <laughs> and so I got thirsty. 
<laughs> that's like okay let's talk about this drinking ceremony okay so here we go uh so uh let's talk about this okay so uh, there was a drinking ceremony uh and i have the inscription right here uh what they're supposed to be doing for this uh, drinking uh, ceremony uh to uh huasasana it goes as follows it says quote they clean then they drink the holy with wine. For the first time, they drink Hususwana's ladle while seated. The singer sings, the singer recites. Then they drink to Muli while seated. The singer sings, the singer recites. But then they drink Hususwana's inner soul. Inner soul, interesting. While seated, the singer sings, the singer recites. After after that, unquote, after that, various breads are brought and distributed amongst the those known as the Alhutra priestesses. Uh, they're known as the lords of the goddess. Uh, and then it's passed to the temple functionaries. And then after that, they lay the bread on tables as offerings. Some of the bread is broken. Uh, some of the bread is not. Then the person on whose behalf the ritual is performed bows down three times. Then all the people of the community then partake of the rest of the bread. And at that point, the priestesses now give each other a ceremony kiss. Uh, so <laughs> that's a pretty detailed ritual. I really find this fascinating is that uh, in, in this is that they're they're going through this whole process of of drinking in the great goddess through the ceremony. Now sometimes, get this, we know that they drink not only from a regular vessel. But in some cases, they drink from a tympanium. They, they drink from a frame drum and they in, in these mysteries. And of course, one thinks about the mysteries of, of, of Ghibli uh, in this regard. Isn't that fascinating? Sorry, just I couldn't resist. Uh, there's other rituals I have here. Uh, uh, one performed by Bapi um, uh, to uh, Huasasana. Um, and this is, of course, to appease a person who had uh, anger the goddess it goes over three days what i find is interesting is this performance is done at the crossroads and it, once again you have all the various breads you know and it's so funny in these inscriptions they actually spend the time listing the different kinds of breads that they will be offering uh to this particular goddess so yeah so we we know a lot about uh this Okay, good. So there you have that. So I had to had to bring that up. Okay, let's go uh, to the next image. There it is. So this is proposed. This is proposed to be Poseidon. Although scholars disagree, it depends. But you can see there's elements here as Poseidon like. This is a connection to the the Mycenaeans. Let's go to the next image now. Ah, here we go. So what was the territory of the Lycians, also uh, known as Aluka? According to the Iliad, the center of their territory was said to be the Xanthus Valley, a place full of orchards and fields. We know that the Lycian city, known as Talawa Kolos, was once an ancient Talawa, uh, sorry, Delawa Talawa. Uh, and this is a picture of it right here. Uh, this is located uh, in the Xanthus Valley, about 14 kilometers from the coast and just east of the Xanthos uh, River. Uh, they are, of course, mentioned as fighting on the side of Troy, specific, specifically those from Tlos. That's spelled T-L-O-S, Tlos, right? Uh, and they're also known for their a beautiful Acropolis with the various rock tombs, right? See that? Go to the next image. There's another image of the rock tombs. Pretty impressive. Okay. Next image. Love it. 
During the late 14th century BCE, a certain king, Mudawata, uh, chased by King Atarasaya of the Mycenaeans, was resettled by the Hittite king at a place uh, known as uh, Syphilis, uh, which is, of course, ancient. It's actually ancient Zepalsa, with the idea that he was supposed to guard the Hittite frontier here. This area was inclusive of what will become uh, the Xanthos River. Uh, you can see the Xanthos River there uh, to the left. This is Lycia. It was called the Sayanta River. Uh, in fact, uh, the area was known as the land of the Sayanta River. Uh, in a treaty of the Hittite king, Mersili II, the Sayanta River is mentioned. Here, the king of Myra Kowali is said to be situated along the Sayanta River and is defined as marking off the territory of Myra. The kingdom uh, of, of Myra, um, sorry, the king of Myra, by a certain Kupata call, was not permitted to cross this very sacred river, with the exception of the sanctuary of Mashualwa, located just on the other side of the river. That will be important later on. Just want you to remember that, that this, there's a sanctuary here. Uh, it, by the way, of course, this is the Xanthos River that they're crossing. Yet another uh, part uh, of, of, over here is a place known as uh, Wuyunawanda, that's spelled W-I-Y-A-N-A-W-A-N-D-A, -A -A, which correlates with Oneida. Let's take a look at the next image. Yeah, look at that. There's Oneida, located in the upper part of the Xanthos Valley and just east of, uh, you see here, um, of, of Xanthos. Uh, Anyway, so we know for a fact it is mentioned in the records of the Hittites that this particular city, Oyanada, was, of course, at that time called Woyawanda, was located along the Sayanta River. And we know for a fact that the identity of these two cities are the same. So we know for a fact that this is the Xantos river uh, look at those cyclopean uh stones they're all kind of fitted together um i know this is not part of the talk but i find it interesting uh, i just will say this off to the side that uh this kind of stone fitting goes back to the minoans and the mycenaeans and uh you're taking these rough stones and they just kind of piece them all together what i find is fascinating is that while this was done during uh, the 13, 1200s uh, BCE, this particular uh, piece is later on. Uh, in fact, you, you see part of the Hellenistic wall right on top of it, it's somewhat later, showing that these traditions continued on. In fact, as another freebie onto the side, I will say that the Mycenaeans mention that they brought over Luvians to help build their cities. And so we are discovering that the architecture and the stone fitting that was uh, that we take for granted, that was part of the aging civilization of the Minoans and Mycenaeans actually had uh, a Luvian influence and that Luvian influence continued long after the fall of the Minoans and Mycenaeans uh, and into uh, the modern period, uh, well, modern period uh, of, of, of Lycia uh, during the Archaic Era, where this happens to date. I know so much for a wall. I know that's kind of an off the wall topic. Oh, come on, there's got to be a laugh there somewhere. Okay, nobody's laughing. Anyway, so there you have it. Okay, so what happened? We're all in the movie, that's why. Oh man, oh man. Um, so not very loyal. Uh Mudawata decided to plot with the city uh Dalawa, which is of course close here, uh, then within Hittite uh territory, to ambush the Hittite general uh, Kusapali and made his ambush. But anyway, um there's a connection here. Let's let's uh let's go to the next image. 
oh, these are really cool. And so you have another, oh, Yolanda, let's go to the next image. Uh, this is Panara. Look at that, beautiful, right? Panara. Now I'll continue. Uh, so what happens is, according to a hieroglyphic inscription, the Hittite king, uh, Tulahia the fourth, who reigned from 1237 to 1209, attacked the Luka land. Uh, Wuyawanda, or of course, Onanda, which we just talked about, and the town of Pina, as well as Arwana, are part of his southwestern campaigns. Pina, as seen here, can be identified as Panara. Don't think of the bread. I know I'm getting hungry now. Located about 29 kilometers from the sea and west of the Xanthos River. You can see here there's ancient tombs. Uh, uh, of course, rock. There's also ancient temples here. It's also known for a Cyclopean masonry, by the way, uh, and uh, which is typical of the Mycenaeans. Let's go to the next image. Oh, there's another example of the tomb there. I, I, that's pretty cool. Next one. Ah, and of course, uh, as for the city of Arwana, this city can be identified as the Iron Age Lycian Fortress, uh, known as Arnana Arena, which later would become known as Xanthos. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, much of the Bronze Age level of the lower citadel is badly eroded, and so it's difficult to determine exactly what happened. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the great city was burned to the ground between sometime between 475 to 450 BCE, and there's a very thick layer of ashes uh, here. So now, next to it, there was a sacred site, next to Xanthos, here we go, that eventually evolved into the holy sacred place dedicated to the goddess Leto. This was once known as the Sanctuary of Mashuawa, uh, M-A-S-H, like mash, right? U-I-L-U-W-A. Uh, <laughs> you gotta love these uh, Hittite Luvian names, right? <laughs> you know, you mean, you mean he's just not so, just not just making up like mashed potatoes? No, <laughs> that's how these words sound like. Uh, let's bring back the ancient Luvian, huh? Anybody? Okay. So this is the ancient sanctuary. Uh, not this, but the, we'll go to the next image. So this is Xanthos, which is kind of the mother city, which is pretty impressive. You know? But nearby is a place that was never a city. It was only a sacred site. First, of course, to the Luvians, and then, of course, uh, to, to the Lycians, and then, of course, later on, obviously, to the Greeks and Romans. So let's go to the next image. Okay, let's talk about this. This image. This image is connected to uh, the goddess Eni Mahani. Now you're wondering, you want to know how this is spelled, so I'm going to do it for you. You're going to sound like say something in Hawaiian, right? Uh, so it's uh, E N I, and that's M A H A N A H I. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just remember you say hi at the end <laughs> uh anyway uh and this was uh one of the same as the sanctuary of mashuawa <laughs> uh, uh mentioned the late 14th century bc so uh during the bronze age um uh, this goddess was also called anis uh, Masanasis, which we heard already before, remember this, right? In Luvian, which now is understood to translate, as I said before, the mother of gods. Now, by the fourth century BCE, the Lycian mother goddess was understood to be Leto. We know this again through the inscriptions. So, the sanctuary of Mashulawa is the same as the sanctuary of Latun. You see the word here, the word Leto in that, L-E-T-O-O-N. An image of any uh, has been found, discovered at Latun. You're looking at it right here. Uh, this is at the Museum of Fete, which offers, by the way, officially the following in, uh, description. This statue was from the Archaic period, 7th century BCE. 
was left half finished. The grooves on the statue may be due to natural causes, rain discovered in the vicinity of Faithe. And I have been to Faithe, uh, so welcome, you know. <laughs> um, we know uh, that uh, it was discovered at the Latoon. It was laying, by the way, on a thorn hedge uh, near the theater. Uh, George Bean, uh, who is very famous for his travels in the area, uh, very well-known Lycian archaeologist, uh, was the one who discovered it for himself. And he said it was unfinished and perhaps it was a student's exercise. I don't know. I, I think it's pretty good. Um, uh, Ezek, uh, Fari Ezek, a lecturer at um, uh, Akadenzi University in Antalya, and the head of excavation to Patara, believes that the statue is an idol of the ancient goddess herself, uh, Eni Mahani, right? Uh, it is comparable to uh, many other anthropological uh, an uh, Anatolian statues of the same period of time. I've seen a lot of these actually at Ephesus. So, which will be another talk uh, at the uh, the Ephesus Museum there. So let's go to the sanctuary of Latoon, which was dedicated to Leto, was never a city proper, but only a holy place dedicated uh, to this goddess and her two children, Artemis and Apollo. Uh, so, in fact, of course, this is mentioned by Strabo and others. So let's take a look at the next image. You'll like this. Oh, there's another kind of image uh, of the goddess mixed with the goddess Kimberly, which I think is fascinating. Good. You can see the, the Tapanian there. Next one. And, oh, yeah, this is an image of Artemis. I like this found at the same area. You can see the coin there, and you see... What's what's left of the Artemis? She's missing part of her nose there. This is also from Latoon and from the, the local museum at the site. Go to the next image. There we go. Okay. So this is the, the, the ground plan of this place, the most sacred place. If you're into Lido, if you really want to know, go to where Lido was considered the most worshipped, most sacred throughout the, the ancient world. This is it. That's why we're focusing on. This is the place. Okay. This is the place to be. And we're going to delve into this in detail because this is the origins of her uh, at her best. Okay. So, um, so as far as we know, the site of the Latoon has been occupied since the seventh century, but there's a reason why it's not earlier is because the groundwater is so high. It is floods on a regular basis and as a result the material culture that's below that level has been severely compromised okay excavations began in 1962 by a certain dh metzger and then our m christian Leroy. here we find as you can see three temples side by side the largest one is on the northern side, and it's identified, you can see in the chart, as number one. This was dedicated to Leto and was of the Ionic order. Uh, it is uh, absolutely the, the largest one uh, and has a very well articulated pronouns, by the way. It's facing west towards the setting sun as a tendency of temples in Asia Minor. For example, the Temple of Artemis is also facing the setting sun. Why is that important? Well, Greek temples, for the most part, there are a few exceptions, are facing eastward towards the rising sun, right? So, but it's the opposite in Asia Minor. You always can tell that's part of the, the character and the Catonic aspects as well. But uh, we can, that's another topic. Uh, the temple has six columns uh, in the front and back with 11 on the, each side with a porch on all four sides, sheltered by a roof that is supported by these columns. Following the pronouns, uh, standing, stands, of course, the nous, which is the inner sanctum, the inner chamber, which has niches on the north and south sides uh, and three niches on the west side, most likely uh, the central niche reserved for Leto. Let's go to the next image. 
oh look oh i love this one right you can see the three right there so the one on the right that is a temple of leto the one on the mental that's the one dedicated to artemis and the one on the left hand side that's the one dedicated to apollo so uh there you have it uh i think that's pretty fascinating the uh, the one in the middle uh, that is the temple of artemis right um and it's located there it's smaller in size no columns at all if i go in i'm tempted let's go to the next image i think it's really cool oh okay i like that one that's that's actually the temple uh of Lido again that's beautiful wow i don't i don't I never get tired of it next one that's beautiful yeah uh this one <laughs> this is the temple of artemis um you said something strange about this one maybe you noticed that uh you see that uh well um there's no columns at all there is a front porch that is cut from uh the, the a, a giant rock there's a giant rock it's fractured um in fact looking at this rock i think i have another image of it let's take a look at this next one i think it's another one yeah there it is <laughs> it's just a big rock now, the fascinating part about this is the rock was originally in that place. It was not moved. So they built the temple around it and it occupied the nous, which means that this rock was considered a sacred rock dedicated uh, to Artemis. That's pretty, it's pretty huge rock. Now, uh, some scholars have surmised that there may have been uh uh, something on top of it like a gallery and so that this rock formed the substructure of this gallery but still demonstrates that it's sacred we have also found inscribed here in the lycian language the word ertimit ertimit uh this is from the fourth century ertimit by the way uh is the uh, lycian name for artemis yeah, so it's E R T E M I T, Ertimit. Got it? So there you have it. And you can see, by the way, this image, you can see it's flooded quite a bit. Let's go to the next image. The next image is a temple of Apollo, right? Of the Doric order. Uh, it's uh, There is, of course, uh, something that's interesting. And go to the next image. And that is, uh, you see here, uh, the lyre of Apollo and the bow and quiver of Artemis uh, in union. And some will surmise that the middle pattern is connected uh, to Leto, uh, bringing the two together. Uh, what I want to bring up that is hardly ever talked about, except in the most arcane of, of, of scholars, is that that looks like a sun, doesn't it? That's right. And it turns out that the Hittites worshipped uh, not just only a sun god, but a, but a sun goddess. Yeah, so uh, it's a sign that this idea continued with the Luvians and continued down uh, with the Lycians and, of course, all the way down. Yes, Arena. Thank you, Ryana. Yes, great. Exactly. Isn't that fun? <laughs> I, just had to, I just had to throw that one in there. But uh, we keep on going. Uh, let's go to the next image. Is this fun? Are we having fun yet? I am having fun here. Oh, this I just like this arch. <laughs> this is the Latoon. It was a sacred sanctuary, so they had it surrounded by a thick wall. Why not? Remember, this sanctuary was separate from Xanthos. It's on its own. That will be important to understand later on when it comes to the legends of Leto. Uh, let's go to the next uh, image. Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> um, uh, I, probably the next picture is really bad. Let's go to the next one anywhere. This is Oyarada. Uh, this, uh, by the way, uh, uh, it, it's it, they discovered another temple dedicated to Lido, uh, and uh, they 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 made it forbidden for us to see it. <laughs> so so it's all off limits. And so I found two photos of it. <laughs> They're kind of small, but I just want you to know Oyarada uh was also uh, uh has a sacred to Lido, and i want to say a few things about it but let's take down this really small 
picture of the sanctuary. Uh, they found here uh, various uh, inscriptions uh, dedicated uh, to uh, Leto. Uh, they found a small altar that was broken in two, but um, uh, they're able to put it together. And uh, it talks about as follows. It says, uh, Oromos, son of Artemias, has made a prayer to Leto that his wife should bear a child. Uh, so this is evidence, of course, that Leto was prayed to uh, not as 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 connected to birth giving, uh, fertility, uh, in the ancient sense. So yeah, so she is a fertility goddess. There's other inscriptions too. Uh, there's another one they they found. Um, it's in a limestone block. It's broken, uh, and it reads as follows: If he sells anything. Let him be answerable to Leto, Artemis of Ephesus, Artemis of Perge, Apollo, and Poseidon. Well, I want to stop there. Why? Hmm. No, I mean, I want no, I don't want to stop there. I want to stop there and pause. Uh, the point is, is you notice the goddesses that they highlight. They're putting together Leto with Artemis of Ephesus and Artemis of Perge. And Perge, of course, is very much a uh, Luvian goddess, and so is Artemis of the Ephesians. And you have Apollo, you would expect that, but Poseidon? That's what I talked about. Not Zeus, it's Poseidon. Still at this time, Poseidon is seen as a top deity occupying the father element. Isn't that fascinating? We'll see other examples. I'll keep reading though. So let Leto, Artemis, Ephesus, Artemis, Perge, Apollo, and Poseidon accept if he willingly gives something back. But if anyone takes anything by force, let him be answerable in the aforementioned God's temple decree. So basically, you know, if he blows it, He's got some goddesses and two gods after him. <laughs> so watch out. Uh, there's other uh, temple regulations that they have found uh, at Oneida. I do find it's interesting, the influence between uh, of Ephesus and Perge. Uh, but uh, again, this listing influence here. Uh, I found another here, but uh, I don't want to keep going here. Uh, oh, here's one more. And a limestone stele, uh, one says, let him be a curse to Leto and her children. The goddess released from her paramone for the sum of 180 drachmas and let no one shut them up again by any force at all. If he does not happen in this fashion, let him be answerable to Leto and her children. So you're seeing that, wow, she is a goddess that uh, you don't mess with, right? What is a paramone? Of course, uh, this, is a, this is a contract or obligation that binds someone to remain with another, uh, with their work and through their works as well. So uh, it's a legal contract uh, that is, it's a binding one. So they're basically swearing on behalf of Leto. And if you don't follow up, uh, you are in big trouble. <laughs> okay. So according to legend, here we go. Uh, Leto was loved by Zeus. Uh, and persecuted by the jealous Hera, uh, fleeing from the goddess's wrath, uh, Leto fled to Patara, where she, in one version of the story, gave birth to the twins. She's giving birth to the twins in all kinds of places. So everybody wants to have Artemis and Apollo on their side. But uh, let's talk about uh, a, a version of the story. I have it right here. I have a few versions of it. The version by Antonius liberalis uh in his metamorphosis um so um antonius says as follows he says that leto after giving birth to apollo and artemis on the isle of asteria now i'm gonna say it's the isle of asteria in some cases they'll call it the isle of ortigia and in some cases uh they will will call it um uh the island, island of Delos, right? So what happened is, is that uh, a long and the short is that uh, uh, on the island of Delos, went to Lycia, taking her children with her 
to the baths of the Xanthos, the baths of the Xanthos. As soon as she arrived in that land, she came first upon the spring of Melody. Now, this is this is the Latoon, right? This is what we just saw. So it was an ancient spring and wanted very much to bathe her children there before going on to Xanthos. So again, this is what makes the Latoon so sacred. But some herdsmen drove her away so that their cattle could drink at the spring, which is not very nice. Leto made off and left Melody. Wolves came out to meet her and wagging their tails led the way, oh, guiding her to the river Xanthos. And then she drank the water and bathed the babes and consecrated the Xanthos to Apollo, that means the Xanthos River, while the land which had been called Tremellus, she renamed Lycia, which is, means wolf land, as in Lycol, right? <laughs> From the wolves that had guided her. Then she returned to the spring. Uh-oh. Leto is back. To inflict a penalty on the herdsmen who had driven her away. So let's go to the next image. Why don't we just take a look at these old, I think we had a picture of the herdsmen. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, this is great. This is this is the area, of course, of where the spring was. You can see uh, it's all flooded there. Let's go to the next image. I think we have another one of the spring. Yeah, so you see this. It's so costly today. It's kind of marshy. The latoon gets flooded out. Uh, this is the place where this legend of the story takes place. You see that uh, it's still uh, uh, causing the, uh, the water to raise there. Let's go to the next one. Ah, there's, there's a nice little, not too old a picture there. Uh, these are the herdsmen uh, doing their, their best to herd her away, but she's going to herd them back. Sorry. Uh, and uh, so what happens now is that uh, she's upset. Uh, and uh, they they were still there washing their cattle. I'm still reading besides the spring. Leto changed them all into frogs whose backs and shoulders she scratched with a rough stone, throwing them all into the spring. She made them live in water. To this day, they crook away by rivers and ponds. So this is the origin of the frogs. Yeah, let's go to the the next image here. Yeah, right, there you go. They're, they're becoming froggies here, right? Um, now, of course, um, uh, this the spring uh, that's called uh, melit or melody. Uh, it, the root could also be the Greek word for honey, right? It also could derive more from the Luvian word for honey, which is not melit, it's mallet. You can see melite. Mallet, there's a similarity. Uh, so, so the Lycians were more apt uh, to connecting uh, this uh, with this source uh, because um, it was, how do I say this? Uh, if you go to Lycia, I've been to Lycia, a lot of the water is just brackish. It's just kind of like sludgy and swampy and everything else. So the very fact that this water was clean and clear was like honey to them in its sweetness. It's like sweet water. Got it? Does that make sense? So that's probably why it got this name. So there you have it. Ovid, in his Metamorphoses, has his own version of the story. I won't read through the whole thing, but um, I, I think the next picture won't be relevant. But let's see the next one. Not no big deal. Yeah, let's take that one down. That one shall return, though. Okay, so in Ovid's version, uh, it goes as follows. He says, in Lycia's fertile fields once long ago, the pro the peasants scorn Latona. Not unscathed, it's not a thing well known. The men, of course, being low-born louts, but marvelous all the same. I saw with my own eyes, says Ovid, the lake and place famed for the miracle. For my old father, too old by then, too worn to take the road had charged me to retrieve some special steers and given me a Lycian for a guide. With him, I traveled those far pasture lands when standing in the middle of a pond and black with ash of sacrifice, behold, an ancient altar ringed 
with waving reeds. I love this source from the first century describing the ancient site. Isn't that great? So he's, he's shown a site, right? This altar ring with waving reeds. He said, my guide stood still and muttered anxiously, be gracious to me. And I muttered too, be gracious. Then I asked him if the altar was built to Pan or the Naiads or some local gods. And he gave this reply. He said, not so, my lad. No mountain god enjoys this altar. It is claimed by her, Leto, who once was the queen of heaven. Wow. He is right. Right, already see this ancient memory of her being a supreme goddess, right? You've seen this right there, still alive in the first century. He continues, Hera barred her from the world who drifted Delos, scarcely dare consent to harbor. When that island swam the sea, there leaning on a palm, Paulus, Athena's tree, Latona, in spite of Juno's or Hera's, bore her twins. From there again, she fled. Uh, hugging her newborn infants, both divine, and now he continues in Lycia, uh, at the Shirma's land. The flaming sun beat down upon the fields. The goddess, tired by her long toil, was parched with thirst. And of course, once again, we have the same kind of story. Some farm folk were there gathering reeds in this version, uh, and of course, the group of yokels <laughs> uh, stopped her. Uh, and she was pretty upset by that, and she de she declared, you know, live in that pool of yours, she cried, forevermore. Uh, and then, of course, uh, it gets really poetic. Uh, and what she wished came true. They love to live in water. Sometimes all their bodies plunge within the pool's embrace. Sometimes their heads pop up. Often they swim upon the surface often squat and rest upon the swampy bank and then jump back to the cool pond. But even now they flex their squalid tongues and squabbling and beneath the water try to croak a watery curse. Their voice is harsh. Their throats are puffed and swollen. Their endless insults stretch their big mouths wide. Their loathsome heads protrude. Their necks seem lost. Their backs are green. Their bodies biggest part. Their bellies white. And in the muddy pond they leap and splash about these newfangled frogs. Unquote. So you got the froggies. So so basically, if you see a frog, they're still angry. They're, ah, they go ah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. All right. So there you have it. In another story, uh, the persecuted Leto uh, is actually aided by wolves who guide her to the river, the Xanthos, where she quenches her thirst and washes her children. In memory of this occasion, of course, she changes the name of the country uh, from Termelis to Lycia, as you, as you mentioned before. Um, uh, of course, Apollo and Artemis, as well as Leto, uh, are known to be worshipped early on in Lycia with the Homeric hymns. Uh, of course, mentioning this, obviously. So it says right here, O Lord Apollo, Lycia is yours. Uh, in the Iliad, there's a reference to Apollo uh, as the Leucogenitus or the born in Lycia or born of the light. There's two interpretations. It could be light or it could be Lycia. So it could be either way. So, yeah. Uh, the Lido cults also existed at Halicarnassus, which is Bodrum today, uh, Canudos, Phrygia, Caria, and Cilicia. Now, at Didyma, it's interesting. Uh, this is where, of course, um, this is by Miletus. According to this, um, this is where Zeus had his relation with Leto to get her pregnant uh, with twins, according to one belief. Uh, this, of course, will become the future oracle of Artemis as well as of Apollo. Uh, and um, uh, this is really close to Ephesus. I will be going there in 2025. Uh, we know that Leto was uh, Zeus's consort uh, at Ditto from his uh, Didyma, excuse me, as early as the 6th century BCE. 
uh, we find, in fact, a terracotta uh, figurines, male and female, identified as uh, Zeus and Leto. Yet they appear, here we go, they appear at an early time to be a man and a wife. Wait, what? Yeah, a man and a wife. That Zeus, his wife, is Leto. In fact, there's a lot of evidence of that. And we go further back, of course, the wife, the, the husband was Poseidon. Are you seeing this? Seeing the shift here? So you have Leto, whose husband is Poseidon. And then later on, Poseidon kind of has his downward spiral and ends up um, moving just to the sea, while Hades is placed down below with Zeus above. It's like, well, I guess Zeus is going to fill in the space. Uh, where Poseidon left off, and then Zeus becomes like a husband to Leto. And then, of course, it changes from there. So there is this gradual aspect. I just find that fascinating. So there you have it. Um, okay, so, um, so that was the Holy Family, right? In some cases, you see uh, yeah, Leto along with Apollo Didymus, uh, and Artemis, and they call her call him Zeus Soter, and they, they understand this as a holy family, right? So at Ephesus, according to local Ephesian mythology, when Leto was about to give birth to Artemis and Apollo in the holy groves of Ortigia, the Curates stationed themselves on Mount Solomissus, high above where with the din of their arms frightened Hera out of her wits when she was jealously spying on Leto. Uh, so let's let's go to this image here. There it is. Yes, this is where it happened, right? Uh, this is where a uh, special college of the Curities held symposiums and performed certain mystic sacrifices in the Ephesian Ortigia. This is actually part of the Ortigia. This is part of the edge. Let's go to the next image. Yes, and this is part of that same hillside. The idea in dactyles, uh, these, these, uh, these, these brights of iron, these daemons would then uh, have a strong connection uh, to the, the Ephesian priests. Here, the uh, Hierokirks, or Sacred Herald, told the story of Hera's jealousy. Leto's escape and the twins born of her below the brown of, of Mount Salamisus with the winged demigod Curates protecting them, flapping away. At some point, either before or after the sacred tale, the Ephesian Curate priests may have reenacted the apotropaic dance of the demigod uh, Curates uh, to describe in the story as warding away Hera from, from Leto. So they actually play uh the dem demigod curities right uh so this this dramatic reenactment were common amongst uh, many of the greek mysteries for instance at eleusis and samothrace next the weapons dance we can go to the next image as referred to by strabo was possibly reenacted here too intended to please artemis enough to honor them with an epiphany after the mysteries sacrifices were offered to artemis Ephesia, well, the city council also made a special sacrifice in the name of the emperor for his continued protection. Banquets followed in the provided accommodations about the Temple of Artemis Savior, which is located somewhere in this particular vicinity. We're actually looking towards where that temple dedicated specifically to Artemis Soterea, Artemis Savior, was located, which is to be understood as separate from the Temple of Artemis. So they had, there's the Great Temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, but there's one located here, and we're actually look, looking out over where its position would have been. The celebrations continued into the night with much drinking of wine, as well as a torch-lit procession moving along the sacred way and going back to the Artemisian or the main. Temple of Artemis. The reference to symposiums by Strabo also reveals that drinking wine was also directly part of the celebrations at Ortigia itself. So they're getting pretty drunk here at the site, uh, most likely providing after the, the provided meal, of course, 
um, and using the local vintage. Go, let's go to the next image. There's another image of the Ortigia general area. So that's where uh, these sacred uh, sites will be located. We'll talk more about this later, but I just kind of want you to have an idea of what it looked like. Ah, why not? We'll just keep going to the next one. There's me at Artigia. That's right. So, uh, they, yes, they found these tombs. These tombs uh, are of the priestesses of Artemis. So, yes, let's go to the next image. Yeah, there's there's overlooking. Um, actually, I'll be talking about this in a few seconds. So uh, we'll, we'll hold on here. This is looking out from Mount Corasis. So we're going to go there in a few seconds. Uh, but, um, of course, Artemis is well known in, in mythology as living on Quail Island. Furthermore, the name for Ortigia was often believed to be derived from the Greek word for quail, ortux. Uh, so, you know, uh, writing in the, uh, this is by, by Servius Honoratus, writing in the late 4th century CE. Ancient myth tells how Zeus turned Leto into a quail in order to protect her from his jealous wife, uh, Hera, because of his infidelity figures, right? Uh, according to legend, uh, it was at Corasis, and we're seeing that mountain right here, at Corasis, where Leto was told she could safely give birth to the twins, Artemis and Apollo. And of course, the Ortigia uh, gardens are located at its base. Uh, more curiously, according to Stephanus of Byzantium, when Artemis asked her mother, Leto, for the meaning of the word, Corasis, she replied, quote, girl, it is your name. Why is that important? Girl, it is your name, Corasis. Emphasizing the Cora, Cor, Cor. Wait, Cor is Persephone. <gasps> Ta -da! which again makes Leto who? That's right, Demeter. You get, are you getting this? Are you following so far? Right? Demeter, Kor, Demeter, Persephone. And of course, therefore, this mountain is dedicated to Kor or Persephone from which, of course, it's believed that Artemis was born. And that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? And so we're we're tapping into an even earlier ancient legend that I get too excited about. But uh, there's more, but I had to mention that, right? So um, now, um, as we know, of course, the two are, are very much connected together. And we, we see this also uh, at the Britannian, uh, the the kind of the city hall Ephesus, where where Leto is is worshipped, but also under the designation as the Meter and Kor again and Hestia. So so once again, demeanor uh, is 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 it can be interchangeably used in many contexts, at least the Ephesian context as well as the Lycian context uh, with Leto. Demeter, Leto, back and forth. And we can see also now the core Persephone connections with Artemis. Okay, so I'm going to read a little bit more, though, on Ortega. Ortega Gardens were known for a, I'm quoting from ancient times, a fine wood with trees of all kinds, possessing the greatest abundance of cypresses. Because cypresses were considered sacred to Artemis, the thick cypress groves must have created a delicate setting for the Ephesians wishing to experience her presence. Strava also describes, quote, many temples in the place, some of which were ancient and contained statues that were just as old. In addition, he mentions temples of later times with statues inside by Scopus. One depicted Latona holding a scepter. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Latona holding the scepter and Ortigia standing by her with the child in each arm, or Tigia standing there with a child in each arm. Scopus, of course, uh, he lived between 395 to 350 BCE. He's the sculptor 
of very important figures related to the mysteries of Artemis uh, Ephesians, Ephesia. He visited Ephesus around 356 BCE. He's very famous. Let's go to the next image just for fun. I think it's just kind of a fun image. Here's me <laughs> on top of Mount Caracas. I couldn't resist. Sorry. There we go. Next, next image. Yeah, there's there's me looking down on Mount Caracas. I'm actually that is a one of the altar sites. You can see the remnants there, right there. Uh, well, those high places from ancient times. Looking down, that most people don't know. You can see the remnants there of the cut stone. Go to the next image. Yes. Okay. So we'll talk about this in a little bit. Uh, this does relate to Ortigia as well as another goddess, but we'll go there in a few seconds. Okay. So you take that one down. We'll go back here. Don't worry. So Ortigia, let's talk about Ortigia there. Um, Ortigia, uh, this Ortigia statue uh, group appears on many coins from Ephesus, in which a woman is represented with a child in each outstretched arm. Ortega being understood as the nurse, right? The nurse uh, taking care of the twins for Leto, okay? So that's kind of how that operates. So so they recognize this. Uh, uh, in some versions, uh, we see on the Ephesian coins minted during the reign of Hadrian uh, that uh, Ortega is looking back in wild fear of the Pythian serpent who's issuing from its hole at Delphi, while the children seem to have no fear at all, later on many will say, "Well, this is uh, this is this will be understood as Leto." So you have an interpretation by the Ephesians that this is Ortigia, and by those in other places they'll say it's Leto. So Ortigia takes kind of a, a a larger role. This nurse now, of course, not to get too confusing, but Ortigia, this nurse, will also be connected connected to the gardens that she was at, known as the Ortigia Gardens. Got it? But then again, obviously, Ortigia could also be related uh, to the form uh, that <laughs> that uh, that uh, that uh, um, Leto takes. But uh, anyway, you got to love going through the, the nettles uh, of ancient mythology, right? So, um, but there you have it. Um, now, interesting, uh, the Ephesians believe that Ortigia, this nurse, traveled with Leto, Artemis, and Apollo, uh, and afterwards was pres present even in Delphi too. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, another possible reference to Ortigia uh, within the Ephesian context arise by way of an Artemisian edict from 162 CE. And I do want to read this, where the inscription states that during this month, are held festivals and the cessation of public business, especially in our city, I'm quoting, the nurse of its own Ephesian god. Wait, so wait. So I want to say something here. The nurse of our own Ephesian god? This is a beautiful moment. Okay, Really, it is. Okay, so Artigia is the nurse for Artemis and Apollo, right? Even though Leto's the one who gave birth. What's interesting here is the Ephesians have decided that they themselves are the nurse nurturing Artemis in response. You guys catch that? There's a give and take. That she's the one who nurses and who is nursed. Uh, the word trophy. It describes somebody who's the, the nurturer. The city of Ephesus is placed in the position of the actual nurse of Ortigia. It fits very well with their own importance of the nurse Ortigia that was played in the Ephesian version of the myth. So in a sense, the Ephesians are saying, we're Ortigia. We're the representation of Ortigia for Artemis. You're, you're hardly ever going to hear this, except uh, as some of the most... Uh, um, well, uh, obscure context, but I thought, hey, learn something that nobody else knows except for very few. Isn't that cool? All right. I just I throw that one in there. So Ortigia. Now, we're going to go a little bit further right here. So in one version, Ortigia was the nurse responsible for taking care of Artemis and Apollo and was a naiad, a kind of nymph inhabiting fresh water, 
fresh water bodies, excuse me, <laughs> uh, springs, lakes, all that, right? So the fresh water nymph, basically. Now in another version of the story, oh, hold on, hold on to your horses. We have horses that we're holding on to. Yeah, you want to hear this one. Ortigia is not, she's actually another goddess. Her name is Asteria, who was the sister of Leto, which is kind of strange. <laughs> so, so, so the sister of Leto. So you have now what I want to mention here. Okay, you ready? Uh, what happens here is that the um, how do we put this? There is a connection here. So now it's the sister who Asteria. Now, uh, if you think. Leto, right? Of course, I'm actually reading the source here. A goddess, how can you not think that Hecate too is one who is a daughter of Latona's sister, Asteria? So we actually have, according to Hesiod, here we go, that, uh, that those two titans that we talked about, they had two girls, you know, Right. Well, actually, had you know, what you had, of course, uh, you had you had Leto, got it, and you have Asteria, got it. Okay, that's so far. So they are sisters. Then Leto gave birth to Artemis and Apollo, and Asteria, according to Hesiod, gave birth to Hecate, and that's how they are connected. Is that making sense? So they are directly related to another. Who said so? Hesiod, which is one of the best sources possible, right? He can't get better. And then he's the early, he, that's what he did. The agony, that's what he did, is identify these things early on. And so we are having uh, a, a direct connection here. So I thought that was a pretty, pretty exciting information. There is a, another source. I'll bring this up. Uh, there's, there's other, actually, other sources that will have three sisters, and that will be uh, that will be Leto, Asteria, and Hecate. I tend to think that that may have been an earlier version, and then of course uh, Hecate gets moved into uh, the position of being uh, the daughter of Asteria. Are you seeing how things are working? And then of course things are moving uh, from there. Okay. How are we doing? We're doing pretty good. Okay, so um, let's talk about Leto herself. Um, so, so oh, one more thing. Uh, Asteria, then what will happen is since or the Ortigia Island, if Ortigia, the nurse, is, is connected to Asteria, they'll call the island, not Ortigia, they'll call it the Asteria Island. You guys got it? That's why. So I know. Okay. So moving right along, or maybe we're not moving, but hey, we're learning a heck of a lot, right? Let's go a little bit further. Um, okay. So let's talk about the image. Let's let's go to the next image here. Oh, by one more thing, uh, Asteria sometimes is not a goddess. Sometimes they have her as one of the the nine Amazons. Uh, but that's a whole other story. Okay, so, oh yeah, so I, I want to show you this. This is Asteria. She is located on the right-hand side, so you, you want to see what she looks like. Uh, there she is, Asteria. Uh, okay, uh, and let's go to the, the next one. As you see, there's 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 a, there's Asteria there also. Um, she was, always gets stuck on the right-hand side, so there she is. <laughs> I guess she's always right, huh? <laughs> I gotta stop. Okay, next one. Oh, okay. Yeah, I want to, and this is obviously a, a more modern image, but I want to bring this up. As for Leto herself, Scopus in the um, in the Ortigia Gardens uh, depicts her not with Artemis and Apollo in her arms, but independently holding a scepter. Scopus therefore portrayed the goddess Leto in a position of majestic strength rather than a, in, a, in a more vulnerable stance typical of how she was represented in later myths. So in the imagination or in the beliefs 
of those at Ephesus, she still retains a, sef, a sense of grandeur, right? In general, these popular tales, obviously, that, that detract from her, tell that after Zeus impregnated uh, Leto, she was cursed by Hera, never to be able to give birth on land. But fortunately, she found a floating island not tethered to the earth, and in this way, technically circumvented the magical restrictions. Uh, in addition, Hera had her chased across the earth by a giant serpent. Uh, you know, it's 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 not a, a story of, of, of strength, but uh, but the Scopus one, the Scopus one, uh, Leto is holding a scepter as portrayed uh, as, as a powerful goddess. Uh, a far more powerful ancient goddess that was worshipped all about Asia Minor and even on Crete. In fact, as I, I said before, Pindar calls uh, uh, her the Leto Presitotus, right? She's also the one that has the spindle. She's always weaving and creating as the mother goddess of Anatolia. And, uh, uh, you know, so she is powerful, right? You know, and so what I, what I think is really upsetting to, to me is that there we have a lot of iconography. Let's, I'll show you a modern depiction. I, I like this image of her, but it kind of gives you an idea of power uh, of what you have. So go to the next image. Yeah, you know, she's powerful. You know, she has strength. Uh, and I, I like that. Go to the next image. Thank you. Now, this is a great image. This is Leto fighting the giants. That, yeah, she's holding a torch in each hand as, and she's attacking these giants that are as about to attack. This is found in the Opius Hill in Rome. Uh, she's powerful. Too bad we don't have a narrative to demonstrate that. Are you guys following me? We've lost these stories. I want to hear about Leto defeating the giants. We by the way, we have stories of her running away from giants. We have a story of her being defended against them. Does that make sense? And so, so again, this is patriarchy, right? Taking away uh, this, this, this powerful uh, deity. How about the next one? Yeah, so you wonder, she's powerful. Look at her. Well, she's with her twins fighting again uh, giants. This is at the Pergamon altar. You know, I want to hear. These tales, these stories of, of strength, right? But we don't get that, right? Yeah, uh, these stories get lost because they're not popular, right? Now, let's go to the next image here. Now, this is a great image. It is. This is Leto's outfit. Uh, this is from the Roman theater of Areopolis. Yes, I've seen this one. Um uh, in art, Leto is still uh, usually dressed modestly, but usually, I mean, still uh, with a veil and uh, appears to be a goddess of moderation. However, that's not how we saw that with Scopus. Are you guys getting this? So she becomes more modest as time uh, goes on. Um, so her characteristics, of course, freely mixed with Artemis of the Ephesians. Uh because she had a veil later on, Artemis of the Ephesians will have a veil uh, as as well. So I think that's that's interesting. So there's a modesty aspect. Uh, let's go to the next image. Yeah, this is kind of fun. Um, there's one other little stratum. Uh, this uh, they have found. Uh, there's a place called Leto's Village in ancient times. Uh, it was dedicated to Leto. And this is Syringa. This is uh, 10 kilometers from Ephesus. And this is famous for its wine. <laughs> you know, it was known for its wine in ancient times, dedicated to Leto. And I think it's so cool that today you can still go to the same place and they're still serving wine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from the very same places where they uh, had these special sacred groves dedicated to Leto. Uh, uh, so I thought that that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> she's worshipped in different places. I know our time, but we have a little bit more time. Uh, she's worshipping Creed, of course, uh, and becoming connected to the Minoan goddess version, obviously. Uh, she is worshipped in, in, in specifically in a place called uh, Phaistos. In fact, there was an initiation cult 
that's connected to her. And I want to mention something about this uh, at, at uh, Phaistos in Crete. Uh, there is uh, a strange story, and it is an, inter an interesting story, and it's told by uh, Antinonius Liberalitus. Uh, it tells the story of where Leto changed a girl into a boy in order to save this person's life. So what we're looking into, this she is connected to these, these areas of in-between, right? And so the story goes, and I have it right here, that when Galatea became pregnant, Lampros, her husband, prayed to have a son and said plainly to his wife that she was going, she was to expose her child if it was a daughter. When Lampros had gone off to tend his flocks, Galatea gave birth to a daughter, feeling pity for her. Uh, she counted uh, on the remoteness of their house and backed up by dreams and seers, telling her to bring up the girl as a boy, uh, deceived Lampros by saying she had given birth to a son and brought the son up as a boy. I give it the name Leukippos. As the girl grew up, she became an utterly beautiful. Because it was no longer possible to hide this, Galatea, fearing Lampros, fled to the temple of Lido and many a prayer uh, to her that the child might become a boy instead of a girl. I'm just quoting from that, that primary source. Lido took pity on Galatea because of her unremitted and distressful prayer and changed the sex of the child into a boy's. In the memory of this change, the citizens of Phaisto still sacrifice to Leto because she had grafted, I'm quoting still from the primary source, because she had grafted organs on the girl and they gave her festival the name uh, Ekadia because the girl had stripped off her maidenly peplos. It is now an observe, observance and marriages to lie down beforehand besides the statue of Lekippos. Kind of interesting kind of ceremony that I don't even have time to unpack, but quite a bit there. Obviously, she was worshipped on Delos. Uh, that's the big one, right? Uh, that is, uh, of course, uh, we don't have a lot of time, but um, that's another major site of where, uh, of course, we kind of covered it earlier, too, of where um, uh, Apollo and Artemis are born. Uh, we, we see this in the Homeric hymns to the Delian Apollo. Uh, it goes as follows. As he, Apollo, goes through the house of Zeus. Let's take a look at Delos, the image there. Yeah, there's Delos right there. Uh, as he, Apollo, goes through the house of Zeus, the gods tremble before him and all spring up from their seats when he draws near as he bends his bright bow. But Leto alone stays by the side of Zeus who delights in thunder. And then she unstrings his bow and closes his quiver and takes his archery from his strong shoulders in her hand and hangs them on a golden peg against a parlor of his father's house. Then she leads him to a seat and makes him sit. And the father gives him nectar in a golden cup, welcoming his dear son, while other gods make him sit down there and queenly Leto rejoices because she bear a mighty son and an archer rejoice blessed Leto for you bear glorious children the lord Apollo and Artemis who delights in arrows her and Ortigia and him and rocky Delos as you rested against the great mass of the Scythian hill hard by a palm tree by the streams of Eunopos doesn't sound like uh, what we've heard before does it no you're not getting that feeling of the rape are you right you're seeing once again you're seeing these ancient stories still continuing on holding fast until patriarchy takes it away does that make sense are you are you guys getting this right i, I figure i gotta read from the sources so you can hear it for yourself but unfortunately what happens shall i sing how the first leto bear you apollo to the joy of men and of course then all of a sudden it goes on to the story of Delos, right? Uh, of what happens is, as we know uh, from Kilimachus, uh, in his hymn form to Delos, uh, is that uh, uh, Hera makes this curse that she cannot have uh, the twins anywhere on land. There's got to be some way to get around this. Well, of course, uh, there happens to be the floating island uh, known as. Ortigia that floats around that is not girded to the seabed, the seafloor, 
uh, also known in other sources as Asteria, right? It floats around. And so what happens is that she flees and goes on the floating island. Uh, and that's where she, of course, bears uh, the two, according to the Greek version. Uh, I like the Ephesian version a little better there. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, what can only hope there? Um, so there's some good quotes here, but I, I know um, we're running out of time here. Um, so you have these various stories. Well, she's about to give birth, by the way. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, Eletia, uh, who is the goddess of childbirth at that time in this context, uh, was being kept busy by Hera. She tried to keep him, her busy so that she would not have an, an easy delivery. And so she held the two babes uh, in her belly for, well, you know, nine days. Uh, and then what happens, of course, is Iris goes forth and gets Elethea's attention. And then as a result, the babies are born and the goddesses, except for Hera, all celebrate. I, 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 I know this is where we get to the, and I'm glad I spent so much time in the earlier part of the stories. Are you guys getting this? Because later on, it just kind of gets depressing as, as Leto, as you can see, is slowly declining in context. It's, you can almost track it from Lycia and, you know, going in uh, to Ephesus and all of a sudden it crosses over to the Greeks and all of a sudden she's just lesser than, right? Uh, it's very, very upsetting. Okay, so, um, oh, then, of course, you have the python. Let's go to the next image. Yeah, okay, so, um, yeah, so we saw again there. Yeah, let's just, just keep on, on going. That's Elethea, right there. That's the image of Elethea there. This is the python story. Yeah, and, of course, now you have this python that's chasing her around. It's not, you know, I don't go into the whole Python story. It's kind of long, uh, but uh, uh, she does get away. And then we have the next story. Let's go to the next image. Yeah, this is all right, this is Leto. Uh, and, of course, and the giant, uh, Titios. According to this story, uh, Apollo was known for slaying this particular giant who attempted to carry off uh, Leto. Uh, who was this Ubian or Phokian giant. So she assaulted the goddess Leto uh, as she was traveling to the shrine of Delphi. Her son Apollo quickly intervened and slew the giant with a volley of arrows and the blade of his golden sword. Uh, as further punishment for his crime, Pityos was staked to the ground in the underworld where two vultures were set to feed on his ever draining liver uh, forever and ever. In fact, of course, in the Odyssey, it says two vultures, one on each side of him, sat and kept plucking at his liver, reaching down to the very bowels. He could not beat them off with his hands. And this was because he had once assaulted a mistress of Zeus himself, a far famed Leto, as she walked towards the Pitho uh, through the lovely space of Penopius. Uh, however, I like Pindar. Let's go to the next image. But you see Leto there covering herself. Uh, there's there's Leto there. Uh, let's go to the next image. It's kind of small. We do have another third image of it. Yeah, there you go. Uh, according to Pindar, it was Artemis, not Apollo, who killed the giant. This is indeed Titios. By Artemis was hunted down with darts from her unconquerable quiver, suddenly sped, and so that a man may learn to touch only those loves that are within his power. So. Yeah, so you have this kind of idea here. Uh, I do want to mention that um, you have other versions of the story um, where um, where Leto is, and you see this in iconography, where Leto is very much involved in this process of attacking the giant. So you can see earlier, uh, earlier shadow of this giant legend. And you can see, you know, where she's fighting giants and all of a sudden it's like uh, her kids are fighting the giants. And then and then she just becomes the weak standard by, you know, it's again, 
this is, I'm sorry, this is so upsetting. Watching this happen, watching uh, this narrative go forth. Um, let's take this down temporarily. I want to bring up one other story that's not that great. It's Leto and the Punishment of Niobe. Apollo was known uh, for his destruction of those known as the Nibides, uh, whose mother had offended Leto with her boasts. Uh, Niobe had 12 children who were destroyed in her palace, six daughters and six sons, because she prided herself in her youth uh, and uh, over the fact that uh, Leto only had two sons. And look at me, I have 12 kids. You know, so two, sorry, so she had twins, sorry, a son and a daughter. And look at me, I have six of each. And it's like, okay. So it's a pretty messed up story. There's one where she, according to pseudo hygienists, uh, it says that these children Niobe placed above those of Leto and spoke rather contemptuously against Apollo uh, and Artemis because Artemis was girt in a man's attire, and Apollo wore long hair and a woman's gown. She said, too, that she surpassed Leto in number of children. Now, again, I want you to catch this. Did you guys catch that? That here you have the idea of, of Artemis dressing more as the male, and you're seeing Apollo dressing more as the female. Right. And and you may just say this is a, as an accident. Well, Niobe, from you know, this context from ancient times has Niobe saying that. So it's not like it's not that people don't recognize this fact that there is this back and forth. And you also saw this, as you guys notice, earlier with what? As you remember, right? Going back and forth, turning the, the female into a, a male. Remember that? Wait a minute. Oh, no, let's go further back. What about the animal? <laughs> right? Are you, are, you guys, are you guys tracking with me right here? Right? So so you have, of course, remember the mongoose, the misunderstanding of the mongoose, again, going back and forth. So this is not just a coincidence. There is this idea of transition. Now, having said that, we do know. That the, that the great mother goddess of Southern Anatolia, connected to the Tapanium, connected, of course, uh, you know, uh, sorry, connected to, uh, sorry, the, uh, yeah, connected to Tapanium, which is the frame drum, right, is also connected to, of course, uh, the, the, those worshipers of Kibli. So there is a connection here. So not only is the great mother obviously connected uh, to Demeter and Leto, but is also connected uh, to Kibli. And you can see a shade of this too, where those uh, will transition those 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 uh, those who are worshipers, venerators of Kibli will go from uh, a male to female. So there is a lot of that uh, going on. But again, that's a whole other talk. Uh, I don't want to go there, but uh, I thought it was fun. Let's let's take a look at the next image. Leto. No matter how much she loses things, uh, great attributes, she is still constantly depicted with both Artemis and Apollo, even long after they are grown up. She is, so it's not just like the Artemis and Apollo show. Leto is involved in their lives. And, and I like that. I like the fact that she's a very involved mother, uh, even later on, which, by the way, is an attribute that uh, continues and should be inspirational for many of you, right? Uh, Aristophanes says, praise Artemis to the maiden huntress who wanders on the mountains through the woods. Celebrate the everlasting happiness of the chaste Artemis, the mighty daughter of Leto and Leto and the tones of the Asiatic lyre which wed so well with the dances of the Phrygian Charities. Oh, there's another connection there. I do honor to the divine Leto and to the lyre, the mother of songs of male and noble strains. Interesting. The lyre, the mother of songs of male and noble strains. The eyes of the goddess sparkle while listening to our enthusiastic chants 
honor to the powerful Phoebus. Hail, blessed son of Leto. So it's moving into to Apollo there. And also, of course, something else is really cool. It says, uh, Statius Achilles uh, says as follows. He says, when Artemis returns, weary to her sire uh, and brother, Apollo, uh, uh, haunt of maidens, her mother, Leto, bears her company as she goes and with her own hand covers her shoulders and bared arms herself arranges the bow and quiver and pulls down the gird up robe and is proud to trim the disordered tresses right so 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 mother leto takes takes in artemis and she, and she basically uh, she tidies her all up right uh, arranges her quiver and even cuts trims her hair you know, an ever active mother and i thought that's that's a that's a great thing right so so where does this lead us yeah i got pages more to go but i think this is i want to end on a high note <laughs> if you don't mind right um and i i think that um what we learn from this is that well unfortunately what we learn from this is that patriarchy takes its toll on these ancient goddesses and we can see them slowly uh, descending and changing uh, through time. However, you can also see that no matter how much they try to repress these ideas, these notions of strength still get re get re get uh, uh, revived. That 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 Leto even today is amongst many circles is viewed as indeed a powerful goddess but the only way that that can happen to continue to happen is to have more knowledge of who she is and what she represents and what is that well she is the goddess of not just knowledge but of the transformation of knowledge as it transcends through the heavens, that she is knowledge that connects to prophecy. She is knowledge that connects to light and making her one who is that which enlightens others. See all these? Oh, yeah, that's right. She is connected with light. Oh, yeah, she is connected with knowledge, prophecy. Oh, and from that, take that strength and build upon it. At the same time, she is not simply a mother. She's not simply the one, which is important, that helps for fertility. Going back to the ancient mother goddess, which is there, fertility. And taking care, in many ways, of, of birth. But she is a mother who never stops being a mother. There it is. You guys get it? Mother who's always there nurturing. Her job is not up just giving birth to Artemis and Apollo. She travels with them. She spends time with them all the way through. And I find that very inspirational as a parent. I find that as a great role model. So Leto, I hope I've... Uh, revealed some of the mysteries uh, going back uh, to the ancient Luvians. And I think you can piece together, piece little by little, of who she is and what she represents. Thank you so much. And have a great night.